Good morning, church. How are we? Everybody all right? As promised, I wore my cowboy boots this morning. Prepared to step on toes. <laughs> oh, man. I love you guys. I'm so happy you're here this morning. Uh, like Blake said, we're kicking off this new series. And, and before we do, I just want to give a shout out to everyone that made this last weekend possible at our Youth Encounter Retreat. Yes. Uh, it takes so many people to pull off an event like that. Uh, Cameron did an incredible job leading and organizing it and sandwich, wave at us, sandwich. Yeah, he, he, he got all the worship team ready and Jason Strickland was there doing the media and Jennifer Neely was there cooking all of our meals. A huge shout out to Miss Neely. Come on, let me hear you, youth group. Uh, God showed up and moved and lives were touched and changed and relationships were built and a whole bunch of kids puked up a whole bunch of milk and I don't know what else you could ask for in a weekend. I mean, it was just a win-win. A, a so uh, uh, I, I'm believing that God's going to do something really deep and sincere in our hearts and our lives these next four weeks. Uh, it's my goal throughout this series to confront you with the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. It's not, it's not my desire to, uh, to beat anybody up, to push anybody away. I think churches have become very accustomed to picking and choosing which parts of the gospel that they want to teach. It's not that they, we don't give you the truth sometimes, we just don't give you the whole truth. You know what I'm saying? So again, it's not, my, it's not my heart this morning to uh, offend or push anybody away. It's my goal these next four weeks to encourage you. It's my goal these next few weeks to challenge you, to push you to a deeper and more meaningful relationship with God. The word that he gave us for 2021 was real. I think we need real relationships with God. We need to be real followers of Jesus. The world is desperate for some real Christians to, to really act like Christians are supposed to act. And so with that in mind, I mean, we're just going to jump into it this morning. Our key verse this morning is found in Luke chapter 9, verse 23. This is Jesus talking. Then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross daily, and follow me. Look at your neighbor this morning and say, follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and, let, and yet lose or forfeit their very self? The question I want to ask each and every one of you this morning is, are you a follower of Jesus? That's the question I want to ask you this morning. It seems like a silly question to ask. I mean, you're in church this morning, right? And for all of you that are watching online this morning, like, Mark, I'm in church, obviously. I'm a follower of Jesus. Mark, I got out of bed. I'm tuning in online. Obviously, Pastor Mark, I'm a follower of Jesus. Like, it seems like this is the wrong crowd that I need to be talking to. Pastor Mark, I don't know if you've seen the back of my car. I actually have a cage bumper sticker. <laughs> okay, like, it's pretty serious. I mean, like, obviously... I'm a follower of Jesus. You preach an incredible sermon like you always do every single Sunday, Pastor Mark. <laughs> Quit it. Cut it out, seriously. And I raised my hand and I said yes to Jesus. And I even walked down the aisle and you prayed with me and you shook my hand like, yes, I'm a follower of Jesus. And, and I even publicly got baptized one Sunday morning, not sprinkled, submerged, man. Like, yes, I, I announced to the whole world that I'm a follower of Jesus. What a silly question for you to ask me, Pastor Mark. I don't even let my kids watch Harry Potter, okay? Lord of the Rings, yes, it's somehow better, but not Harry Potter. It's way more spiritual. I wear a shirt to work every single week that says, God answers knee mail. I mean, I don't know what else you could ask for me. The guy's knees are worn out, like he spent a lot of time in prayer. I wear it proudly, okay? I wear a wrist bracelet sometimes that says WWJD. What would Jesus do? If that doesn't make me a follower of Christ, I don't know what would. Here's what's really official. Go to my Facebook page. Go to profile. Look under religious views. In big, bold letters, it's going to say Christ, follower. If being Facebook official doesn't make you a follower of Jesus, I don't know what will. Do I have a witness this morning? I mean, it's official, yes. 
I believe that the vast majority of you here this morning believe that you are a follower of Christ. I believe that. I think the confusion comes in sometimes is we get mixed up on what the definition of a follower is and what the definition of a fan is. I want to help, help you clear that up this morning. The definition of a fan is an enthusiastic admirer. That's what the definition of fan is, enthusiastic admirer. Today is Super Bowl Sunday. I'm an enormous football fan. Some of you are too. You passionately follow OU or the Dallas Cowboys or Oklahoma State. I mean, you're passionate about it. And, and this really helps us understand, I think, what a fan is. Because a true fan, I mean, you're going to watch every single game. You are. I mean, that's, that's what a fan does. I didn't miss one Browns football game this year. I'm a Baker Mayfield fan. Okay? I mean, and when I wasn't able to watch, I was falling along on my phone, and I'm screaming at my phone. And, but a fan watches every single game, either, either on TV or even you go in person, and a true fan is going to scream, and a true fan is going to cheer. I act like a fool during a football game, especially when I'm by myself. I'm, I jump in, I'm screaming at the television. I'm telling you, I'm a fan. So, and a real fan will have a jersey, might even have a bumper sticker. If you get the opportunity to go to a game, like you're gonna, a real fan's going to be the guy with the shirt off, with some chest paint. It's the one time in life where the bigger your belly is, the better. Okay, these small little dudes that don't have much belly, like that's just less for you to paint, right? I mean, some dudes get like one letter on their chest. Some dude gets like whole sentences. That's the fan right there. Of course, the fan never breaks a single sweat. A fan's not putting in any of the work, obviously. But man, you're there on the sidelines and you're cheering them on. A real fan's going to know all the players' names. It baffles me how much knowledge some people have of players' names, where they went to college, where they got recruited from high school. They know all their stats. I mean, the, the analytics. They, I mean, you're a fan. And if you're a real fan, you might have even waited in a line somewhere to get an autograph. You met that person. And your autograph sits on your desk, and it covers up your family portrait. I mean, like, you are a fan. It's your prized possession. You might have met some of these people, but you don't know any of these people. You have no type of personal relationship with them whatsoever. But you're a fan. And even though you're not part of the team, sitting right there in your armchair, you absolutely know what could be better about that team. Even though you've made no sacrifice... Even though you have made no contribution, somehow your opinion should matter. You will cheer for your team as long as your team is winning, as long as they're drafting the players that you want them to draft, as long as they're calling the kind of plays that you want them to call, as long as they're making the coaching changes that you think they should make, just in general, as long as the team is doing what you want them to do and moving in the direction that you want it to be moving, you're a fan. But let's get honest, I did not care one bit about the Cleveland Brown three years ago. And if they ever get rid of Baker Mayfield, I will never cheer for the Browns again as long as I live. I'm a temporary fan of the Cleveland Browns. And some of you are too. As long as the team's doing what you want, making the decisions that you like, they're winning, they're winning, things are great. But if that team starts to lose, and they lose for three, four, five, six years, I have no idea how some of you Oklahoma State fans are still fans. I respect it. I respect it. I do. I think that speaks a lot to your character, how you can just embrace mediocrity for so long. It's beautiful to watch, really. But it comes to this point in time where the team is not satisfying your needs, not doing the things that you think they should do, and you are free to walk away from being a fan of that team because the reality is, is that you have nothing invested in that team. Nothing whatsoever. You can scream, you can cheer, but you are on the sidelines. You're not sacrificing, you're not putting in the work. You are a fan, friends. Jesus has a lot 
of fans on planet earth. I mean, he has a lot of fans. As long as God is blessing your finances, blessing your marriage, as long as your kids are on the straight and narrow and they're excelling in sports and they're getting scholarship opportunities, as long as everything in life is working out just the way you think it should work out, oh, praise your holy, sweet, precious name, Jesus. You're on the front row, hands raised. God is so good. It's wonderful. But the second that things in your life start to happen that you don't like, it's wonderful when you get a raise. It's God's the best thing in the world. But when you lose your job, you get laid off. All of a sudden, God's not good. All of a sudden, God's not faithful. When your marriage starts to get a little rocky, when your kids start to make decisions that you wish they couldn't make and to do everything you know how to do, but you can't make those decisions for them, it gives us this opportunity that so many people in the American church take full advantage of where you just say, bye. God, you're not meeting my expectations. And millions of people across America today are sitting in churches just like you. And as long as the, they like the preacher, they think he's funny and they think he's charismatic enough, as long as they approve of the types of sermons that he preaches, as long as they approve of his songs choices, as long as the kids' ministry is up to par, it's the best church ever. K-H, welcome home, hashtag, best church ever. But you better not offend me. You better not hurt my feelings. You dang sure better not expect me to tithe, and you sure as heck better not expect me to serve. Because church is about me, friend. I told you I wore my boots for a reason. If the church doesn't measure up for two or three, four weeks, a year or two, it's bye, bye. And I'm going to take my lukewarm, apathetic Christianity to the next church down the road, and I'll stay there for a season, and then I'll go to the next church, and the next church, and the next church, till I find a place that meets my needs. I'm a fan of Jesus. I'm terrified today that the American church has become a stadium for fans and not a sanctuary for followers. I'm terrified today that the American gospel is not centered and based around Jesus Christ and what his word says and what his word teaches. We've twisted, we've diluted, we've watered down the gospel, and man is in the center. And instead of preaching the unadulterated truth, we try to make people feel comfortable. We try to make people feel happy. We have catchphrases like he wants you to be healthy, wealthy, and blessed. Who wouldn't sign up for something like that? We major on those things of the Bible that are things that are attractive. We major on the parts of the Bible that are personally profitable. He's got a future and a hope, healthy, blessed, blessed to anointed, to be disappointed. And we just glaze right over the parts of the gospel where it says it's going to cost you something. It's going to be difficult. There's hardships. I no longer live. Christ lives in me. I have died. I've been crucified with Christ. That's like in the small print, the bottom of the contract, the kind of, you just kind of glaze over that part. But he wants to bless you. He wants to prosper you. Your best days are out in front of you, friend. It's going to cost you nothing. Raise that hand. You know exactly what I'm talking about. In essence, we have perfected the art of selling Jesus. We perfected it. I know how to sell Jesus. I'm guilty. I can tell you everything that you want to hear about Jesus, present it in a way that's going to benefit you and profit you personally. And I'm going to glaze over all those other details because at the end of the day, I want this place to be full. And I love when hands go up all over the place. And at the end of the year, I can stand up here and say, 154 people gave their hearts to Jesus. And everyone says, hoorah, yay, King's house. But are we creating fans or are we creating followers? Yeah, I have an incredible video this morning I want to show you that I, I think really illustrates this point that I'm trying to drive home, how we have become professional at selling Jesus. Tune in, would you? You're, gonna, you're in for a real treat. Hey, King's House family, Pastor Mark here. 
Listen, I've, I've met an extraordinary individual who has an extraordinary opportunity for you that I think could revolutionize your life, your family, your marriage, your finances. Listen, I think I would be doing you an incredible disservice if I didn't give you the opportunity to meet this individual. And hey, let's just take a few minutes and let's just hear him out and hear what's on his heart. I trust today it's going to bless you. Hey friends, KH Chris here with KH Merchandise. Have you ever wondered and worried that by the end of your life, your life would seem like it is absolutely meaningless? Wow. Are you ready to add value to your life? Are you ready to have a happy, healthy, safe marriage today? Are you ready to be blessed so you no longer have to be stressed? Are you ready to be anointed so you no longer have to be disappointed? Yeah. Come on, Chris! Yeah, tell them! Are you ready to be debt free so that you can walk down your very own streets of gold up to the pearly white gates? And when those pearly white gates open, friend, there is a mansion waiting for you with your name on it. Are you ready to live in a place where there is no pain, no suffering, yes. and no hurt? Does burning in hell for all eternity sound like fun to you? I don't think so. Introducing the golden ticket to heaven, your very surefire way to avoid hell's fire on your way to heaven. This beautifully crafted, one-of-a-kind, gold-plated ticket can be yours. Phones are already ringing off the hook, so don't wait. Hurry, this offer won't last. Perks to owning your very own golden ticket to heaven include, but are not limited to, salvation, revelation, restoration, but no condemnation. But wait! There's more. Act now and we'll double this offer. That's two tickets for the price of one, where you can take anyone you want to with you on your way to heaven, even if they backslidden. And yes, the fine print does say you can take a pet if you value them over your spouse. Don't wait, act now. King's House Chris, this is amazing. How much does it cost? Well, Mark, it's free. Free, free, free. No way. How long is this offer available? Well, Mark, it's only for a limited time because let's face it, no one is promised tomorrow. And what do I have to do to get this ticket? Well, Pastor Mark, all you got to do right where you are right now, with every head bowed and every eye closed, just simply lift up your hand if you want to receive your very own golden ticket to heaven. Yes, ma'am, I see that hand. Yes, yes, sir, I see that hand. God bless you, sir. Yeah, oh, a whole family of five. God bless you. Yes. Oh, I see that hand. Yes, thank you. I see that hand. I see that hand. Wow, we're going to... Wow. There's... This limited time offer of your very own beautifully crafted gold-plated ticket to heaven is actually not free because being a true follower of Christ will cost you something. You must be willing to surrender your life to another. Your life will no longer belong to you because you are bought with the greatest price. You'll no longer be able to make decisions on your own because he will make them for you. New owners of this amazing item will be guaranteed to have hardships, trials, and disappointments. While taking this item, you will experience such things as being mocked, laughed at, and ridiculed by family, friends, and even complete strangers. Being a follower of Christ is not for everyone. If you are experiencing discomfort in your body because this sounds entirely too weird, please consult your pastor before using this item. If this message has offended or hurt your feelings in any way, please contact our complaint department, Blake at the King's House Church. Oh, man. Cameron has made some great videos, but that might be his best work ever. I'm concerned at how good Chris is at infomercials. Uh, the question I want to ask you today is, have you made a decision... Or have you made a commitment? I want, to, I want to break this down for you this morning. You might be here this morning saying, Mark, isn't that kind of the same thing? I mean, I made a decision for Christ. I made a, a commitment to Christ. No, friend, it's not the same thing at all. Let me show you an illustration this morning. I can make a decision to marry someone. I made a decision to marry Erica. I could stand right here on this altar and I could say, for better or worse, till death do us part. Like I am, I am you're going to be your husband. I am making this decision. I'm going to be faithful. We can go on our honeymoon, and that very trip, I can sleep with another woman. And I still made a decision to get married. I just didn't make a commitment to be faithful. You see the extreme difference? Words don't define a relationship. Actions define a relationship. I think the problem with the church today is, is that many have made a decision to believe in Jesus without making a decision to follow Jesus. And there's a huge difference in there. I want you to look in John chapter 3, 16. I want to show you the difference. 
a decision to believe and not a commitment to follow. You all know this verse. For God, yeah, go back to that verse for me. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes, whoever, if you believe in him, you shall not perish but have eternal life. We love this scripture, don't we? I have like offended you terribly this morning already. And like we're just getting started. This is a concern. We love this scripture, don't we? We, we memorize it as a kid. Like that's me. I believe in you, Jesus. I believe you're the son of God. I believe you died on the cross. I believe you're the only way to heaven. Yes, I believe in Jesus. Pat on the back. You're ready for heaven, friend. That's the truth. It's just not the whole truth. Because Luke chapter 9 says this. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross daily, and follow me. Like, whoa, 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 time out, Pastor Mark. Like, I'm all on board with this believing stuff and eternal life and being prosperous and blessed. What? Denying myself? Picking up my cross daily, like this is going to cost me something. It's going to affect the way that I, I live my life. It's going to affect the, the, the choices that I make. It's going to affect my decisions. Like, whoa, I, I want to believe in Jesus, but I didn't sign up for all this. Here's some food for thought for you this morning. In the four Gospels, Jesus says, believe in me approximately five times. In those same four Gospels, Jesus said, follow me approximately 25 times. See the difference? It's not enough to believe in Jesus. Are you kidding me? Demons believe in Jesus. The devil believes in Jesus. Satanists believe in Jesus. It's not enough just to believe in Jesus. A belief demands an action. It does. If I came to Curtis this morning and I said, Curtis, there is a bomb underneath your seat. It's going to detonate in 10 seconds, right? If Curtis actually believes me, that demands an action. And that action's not to say like, oh, dang, that's, that's a tough situation. Man, a bomb, huh? Boy, I wonder if I'm going to go to a Mexican after this or maybe grab a burger or maybe some Chinese. But oh, hope Mark gets done by 11.15 because once the Baptists hit that... Chinese buffet, it's all downhill from there. I believe you, Pastor Mark. I believe you that there is a bomb underneath. Yes, yes, I believe it. I believe it. Yes, yes. No, you don't. You don't. If Curtis believed there was a bomb underneath his seat and it's going to detonate in 10 seconds, this dude is jumping up. This dude, these old legs haven't moved that fast in a long time. Come on, Curtis. I mean, he's going to fly out. of. He's going to grab Cindy or he's going to trip Cindy. I'm not sure. <laughs> One or, the, one or the other, like he's going to go running and screaming out of this place. Get your kids, there's a bomb in the church. Because a belief demands an action. It's not enough to believe. You have to commit to follow. Look at this. To truly believe is to follow. To truly believe is to follow. You can't separate the two. The enemy has made it separate in our lives somehow. And if you just believe, if you just, no friend, that belief demands action in your life. If you believe in Jesus the way the word says, then you have to follow him the way the word says we have to follow. The two are one and the same. Belief and follow are synonymous. I want to show you this morning the difference between a fan and a follower. Out of John chapter 3, this is a story about a man named Nicodemus. Now, there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling class. So I just want to help you understand this morning, Nicodemus, at the age of five, would have started to learn and study the Hebrew language that the Old Testament was written in. At the age of five, he's learning Hebrew. All right, well, this guy's not casually researching the, the Bible. I mean, it's more than just bedtime stories. By the time Nicodemus is 13, he has not read, he has memorized 
The first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, he has memorized that. He has memorized Psalms, he has memorized Proverbs, and he has memorized the Old Testament prophets. Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Habakkuk, Malachi, Zephyr. He has memorized those by the age of 13. He knows all 613 laws that are found in the book of Leviticus. And he strategically tries to live his life by every single one of those 613 laws. And if you're a Pharisee, it's not enough to keep those 613 laws. They made even more laws to make it even more difficult for people to not break those 613 laws. So if the law said, hey, don't touch the piano, a Pharisee, a Pharisee is going to say, dude, don't even touch the stage. Like, so this is what he's done his entire life. A Pharisee was, was really a political party within the Jewish system. They were highly revered. It required an incredible amount of work. The fact that he was part of the ruling class in the Jewish council meant that he was widely known, widely respected, and extremely powerful and extremely wealthy. Like this isn't just some dude coming to Jesus. This is this man has worked his whole life to attain these positions. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one could perform the signs that you are doing if it were not, no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Nicodemus comes to Jesus and says, I believe in you. He does. Like, listen, I believe you're a teacher. That word rabbi means like this highly respected teacher. I believe, I believe you're from God. I'm expressing my belief. Jesus, I'm quite a big fan. I can't believe what you're doing, these miracles, these signs and wonders. You're obviously from God, and I am a huge fan. Jesus, I want you to know I'm cheering you on, man. You're killing it. I'm coming to you at night because... Be a little frowned upon if my friends knew that I was here seeing you. Jesus, you're kind of mean to the Pharisees. You call them snakes. You call them vipers. You say that they are whitewashed tombs. They look great on the outside with all their rules and regulations and, and their ability to, to strictly live by these things. But you said on the inside they're full of dead men's bones. You're not impressed with their self-righteousness and their ability to follow the rules. So Jesus, the, the Pharisees aren't, aren't real big fans of you, but I am. And I just want you to know tonight that I believe in you. I just kind of want to keep it on the down low. So I'm here in the middle of the night so no one will see me. Notice that Jesus doesn't pay any attention to his flattery. Jesus put, acknowledges, at, doesn't acknowledge at all that Nicodemus is a fan, that he's expressed his belief in him. Look at, Jesus just cuts right to the chase, man. He says, very truly, I tell you. No one can see the kingdom of God unless they're born again. He didn't acknowledge any of that stuff. Like, let's cut to the chase. How can someone be born when they are old, Nicodemus asks. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and they are born of the spirit. Long story short, Nicodemus, what you have up to this point is not enough. An ability to follow all the rules and an ability to follow all the regulations and all those laws. It's not enough to get you into heaven. It's only by grace. It's only by faith. Nicodemus, what you have is not enough. I appreciate the fact that you're a fan. I appreciate the fact that you celebrate me from a distance. But being a fan is not enough. You have to be born again. You have to surrender your life to me, Nicodemus. You gotta start all over. There's only one way to do this thing. In John chapter three, there's no resolution to this conversation whatsoever. Story's just kind of over, but I think many find themselves in this same type of predicament that Nicodemus did. I believe in Jesus. And God, I'm like, I'm all about what you're doing. Wow, I mean, you're an awesome guy. I am a fan of yours, Jesus. I'm just comfortable to kind of watch from a safe distance. I'm comfortable to cheer you on. I'm comfortable to come to church some. And Jesus, did I mention that I only listen to Caleb? I mean, do these look like trash cans to you? No. 
So it's not that I don't appreciate what you're doing. It's not that I don't believe. I most certainly do believe. I'm just not ready to go all in. Let's not get crazy. If I do that, that might cost me something. That might change the way that I have to live my life. Going all in might cost me my personal goals, my personal dreams, might cost me some relationships, might cost me some money, might cost me my reputation. Jesus, hey, you're a fan, you do you, and I'm just gonna be back here and I'm just gonna do the the best that I can do. Let's just meet in the middle and I'm committed to do that, Jesus. Yeah, great, great sermon, Pastor Mark. The problem with that type of gospel is that half commitment is no commitment at all, friends. I can't be halfway committed to my marriage. I would not have a very successful marriage. Well, Erica, I I mean, I sleep in the same bed with you six nights out of the week, for goodness sake. Give me one night to go out and party with the boys, you know? Come on. You should, one out of seven? Erica should be far more understanding than that, right? It's ridiculous. Her expectations are just too much for me. Of course not. A half commitment is, it's, it's no commitment. We don't hear again of Nicodemus until John chapter 19. This is after Jesus has been crucified. It says, later, Joseph, uh, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now, Jesus, Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, because he feared the Jewish leaders. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by, hey, there he is, Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices and strips of linen. This was in accordance with the Jewish burial customs. I I don't know what happened between John chapter three and John chapter 19, but something happened. I mean, this man who timidly came to Jesus at night because he didn't want anybody to see because of the repercussions. Do you realize that all the other disciples had dispersed except John? Jesus' best friends are nowhere to be found, but all of a sudden Nicodemus is here? I mean, this guy's, Jesus died at three o'clock in the afternoon. I mean, it's not like the middle of the night when Nicodemus goes to get the body, it's broad daylight. I don't have a lot of experience taking bodies off of a cross, but I would assume that it's hard to do that kind of secretly. It's not like Jesus buried, uh, crucified in some obscure place. I mean, it, it was right where everyone could pass by and mock. In the middle of broad daylight, this man Nicodemus takes the body of Jesus off. And I don't know how far it was from Calvary to where they buried him, but let's assume that Nicodemus didn't drag dead bodies through the streets on a normal basis. Like, oh, old Nicodemus, there he is, dragging a dead body through town again, that rascal. <laughs> He's at it again, Nicodemus, uh. Of course not. Something's happening in this man. Something happened between John chapter three and John chapter 19. And there's obviously this deep, profound affection that he has for Jesus. 75 pounds of aloe and myrrh in today's terms is over $200,000. He wasn't making a decision to believe that day. Nicodemus was making a decision to follow. Because all of a sudden, being a follower of Jesus is about to cost him something. It wasn't enough for him to come to Jesus in the shadows of the night and say, Jesus, I believe in you. Now he's in broad daylight for the whole world to see, expressing his love and affection for this man named Jesus. Church history tells us that Nicodemus lost his position among the Pharisees, absolutely lost his reputation. Church history tells us that he was literally physically ran out of Jerusalem. For the rest of Nicodemus' life, he lived in poverty. And sometime in the first century, Nicodemus actually gave his life as a martyr for Jesus. Somewhere in this journey, what started as a fan of Jesus blossomed into a full-fledged, wholehearted follower of Jesus Christ. That's the difference. We've done our best to water down the gospel to make it as comfortable and as palatable as we could possibly make it. We want to make it so easy, accessible. 
But the whole truth this morning is, King's House, is that there is no forgiveness without repentance. There is no salvation without surrender. And there is no believing without committing. That's the uncomfortable truth this morning, friends. There's no forgiveness without repentance, no salvation without surrender, and no believing without committing. You can't separate the two. If I was to go to a psychiatrist today, some of you might think that I should, I would lay down on that couch and let's imagine they said, what are you here for, Mark? What can we help you with today? Now pretend with me that I say, I don't really think I should be here. My friends and family are the ones that encouraged me to come, okay? Here's the deal, I believe I can fly. I believe I can touch the sky. I think about it every night and day. I just wanna spread my wings and fly away. I believe I can soar. I see me running through that open door. I believe I can fly. And the psychiatrist would be writing down a word next to my name that says delusional. They would. Delusional. You can't fly. I believe I can, man. You don't, I mean, I've been jamming out to R. Kelly for years, man. I can fly. They would write delusional by that because here's the definition of delusional. A belief that is firmly maintained, though it is contradicted by Mr. Reality. A belief that is firmly maintained, though it is contradicted by reality. And the sad reality that we face in America today is we have churches full of people who are delusional. You say that you believe in something, but the reality of your life says that's not the truth. Like Moy Bovitz show, like the results are in. Jesus ain't your daddy. It's not true. Well, I believe. I got this strong belief. It's firmly maintained. I'm a follower of Jesus. Well, let me ask you this. Are you a fan or are you a follower? Let me just ask you. Did you make a decision to believe in Jesus, or did you make a commitment to follow Jesus? Two very different things. I'm trying to help you understand, am I delusional or not? Did I make a decision to believe in Jesus? Yeah, I believe in him. Okay, did you make a commitment to follow him? Here's another question for you this morning. I want to help you out. What has following Jesus cost you? What has it cost you? Has it cost you friends? Has it cost you relationships? Has it cost you comfortability? Has it cost you money? Has it cost you a reputation? What has it cost you? Is he just your savior or is he your Lord? We love Jesus the savior, the guy who died on the cross for us, the guy who took my place, paid for my sin, now I get a golden ticket to heaven. I love that Jesus. But Jesus, the Lord says like, I bought you with the price, bro. Your life doesn't belong to you anymore. That was in the fine print. Maybe some of you didn't read. You don't get to make your own decisions anymore. I make those decisions for you. Your money's not your money, that's mine. Everything in your life belongs to me because you surrendered. Lord, study that word in the Hebrew and it's like a slave owner. I belong to Jesus, I'm a dead man. I do what he says, I go where he goes. I, wh- is he your savior today or is he your Lord? Big, big, big difference. So here's the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, King's house. Following Jesus will cost you everything. 
Following Jesus will cost you everything. Following Jesus is going to be harder than you want it to be. Following Jesus is going to cost you more than you want to give. Following Jesus is going to require you to go places you don't want to go, and it's going to require you to do some things that you don't want to do. That's the whole truth. But the end of that story is, is that following Jesus is absolutely, positively, 150% without a doubt, the best thing you can ever do for your life. It's completely, completely, totally worth it to be a wholehearted follower of Jesus. And that's what he has for each and every person in this room this morning. Do you know why some of you have so many issues in your life? Because you're a fan. And there's parts of your heart and there's parts of your life that are off limits to God's. You know why so many of your marriages have so many issues just over and over and over and over? Because you refuse to make Jesus the center of it. You want to be in charge. Do you know why your finances are an incredible mess? Because you refuse to let Jesus be in charge. If you would just do what the word says to do, he could take care of you. But you're in charge, man. You got it figured out. Right? He has abundant life for you. The best life you could ever think of, dream of, ever imagine. But you got to be willing to surrender if you want to walk in those things that God has for you. I can't stress enough today how much I am not trying to beat you up, how I am not trying to make you feel guilty. I just want to confront you with the truth because I want the best for you. I want what God has for you. But I don't have a magic wand and we don't have a golden ticket that's going to magically make your life better. You have to take this word and apply it to your life. You have to make a decision. I'm ready to be a follower of Jesus and not just a fan. If you will do that today, friends, it will revolutionize your life in an incredible way. I've wholeheartedly followed Jesus for 21 years of my life, and I have zero regrets, friend. Did you hear me this morning? I have zero regrets. The only thing I would do different is I would follow Jesus sooner. I spent way too much of my life doing my own thing that led to heartache and pain and all kinds of disillusionment. I wish I could go back and be a wholehearted follower of Jesus sooner. The only thing I would do different, the best thing you could ever do with your life is the perfect will of God. Would you pray with me this morning? Jesus, I I love you so much. I love you. And God, you don't beat us up. You, you, you don't put us down. You're not, you're not mad at anybody this morning. Sometimes love, sometimes grace looks a little different than we think it should. But sometimes we have to come face to face with some hard truths and some hard realities in our lives. Holy Spirit, I'm going to ask you this week that you would just investigate each and every one of our lives, that you would search us, that you would show us those areas that we're just fans and not followers. Show us those areas of our lives that we haven't given you permission in. God, I know that you have beautiful plans, incredible hopes and futures for every person in this room to go further and do more than they could ever imagine, but that doesn't come without a cost. We have to be willing to surrender our lives to you, to deny ourselves, to pick up our cross and to follow after you. Jesus, we want to be those kind of Christians. God, I thank you. I love you because you love us in that same kind of passionate way. There's nothing you wouldn't do to be with us. God, we want to be able to reciprocate that same kind of devotion to you. Jesus, there's nothing I wouldn't do to be with you. Jesus, I love you. I thank you. I give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name, everyone said. Hey, give me some praise this morning, would you, King's House? I love you so much. Hey, Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, we're going to have a few songs and we're going to break up. We're going to discuss some of these things, learn how to apply them to our lives. Have a great week. I'll see you Wednesday night. God bless you.